I'm Helen Christians and I will be your MC this morning. I'm so glad that you're able to join us and I wish you a joyful Valentine's Day on this wintry Sunday morning. HGP is an all volunteer group that believes strongly in freedom of speech, but I must state that the views expressed by myself, our reader today, uh, our speaker, HGP members, and our guests at today's meeting are not the official views of the humanists of Greater Portland. Humanists believe in a progressive philosophy that without supernaturalism advocates living an ethical life based on science, reason, and free inquiry. The American Humanist Association has developed a list of behaviors associated with the humanist philosophy. One of these behaviors is ethical development. The key to understanding ethical development is acknowledging that nobody is perfect or has all the answers. Ethical development is a never ending process that requires constant reflection and evaluation of our personal choices and the consequences that our behaviors have on others. But each new day carries with it new challenges and new moral dilemmas. Humanists should continually adapt and rebuild our moral frameworks with the goal of becoming ever better human beings. I believe that our program today, Ethical Values, Social Values, and the Sciences will give us information that will deal directly with the humanist behavior of ethical development. I'd like to welcome Ann Henderson now, who will be doing our reading this morning. I'm going to do uh, two little poems. Actually, one's a pretty good sized poem, and then there's one about love, you know, with Valentine's Day. Yes. So it's, it's a very uh, simple one. Love is patient, is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love never fails. This is my first, my last one. Okay. A Quiet Life by Baron Wurmser. What a person desires in life is a properly boiled egg. This isn't as easy as it seems. There must be gas in a stove. The gas requires pipelines, mastodon drills, banks that dispense the lozenge of capital. There must be a pot, the product of mines and furnaces and factories, of dim early mornings and night owl shifts, of women in kerchiefs and men with sweat soaked hair. Then water, the stuff of clouds and skies, and God knows what else causes it to happen. There seem always to too much or too little of it, and more pipelines, meters, pumping stations, towers, tanks. And salt, a miracle of the first order, the ace in any argument for God. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, let's see, only God could have imagined from nothingness the pang of salt. Political peace, too. It should be quiet when one needs an egg. No political hoodlum, hoodlums knocking down doors. No lieutenants who are ticked off at their scheming girlfriends and take it out on you. No dictators posing as tribunes. It should be quiet. So quiet you can hear the chicken, a creature usually mocked as a type of fool, a cluck chained to the chore of its body. Listen, she is there, pecking at a bit of grain. Our speaker today, Dr. Anjan Chakravarti, um, will be taking questions at the end of his presentation. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Anjan Chakravarti, is the opnig, op, and I'm going to ask you to repronounce this. I forgot to double check with you. Opignani Foundation Chair for the Study of Atheism, Humanism, and Secular Ethics at the University of Miami. He has authored numerous books and articles in the philosophy of science, metaphysics, and epistemology, and has taught previously at the University of Cambridge, University of Toronto and at Notre Dame. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Chakravarti to our HGP Sunday morning meeting. Thank you and thank you so much for coming all the way from Miami. Well, thank you so much, Helen. That was very kind. Uh, and uh, let me also say thank you to Joyce for reaching out in the first place with uh, this very nice invitation to join you, which is really a pleasure. And uh, also to Dave, of course, for hosting and to everyone for tuning in on this uh, 
very special Valentine's Day edition of your Sunday meeting. I, I have to admit, I tried and failed to make the content more romantic this morning. Uh, so, you know, I understand that forgiveness is part of love. So, you know, perhaps you could just incorporate that sentiment as we go through uh, the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, I apologize for the barking in the background. Our dog never barks, but of course he would save it until uh, I'm on Zoom. So as Helen mentioned, I'm a philosopher and uh, more specifically, I'm a philosopher of science. So before I do anything else, I thought it might be helpful to take just a, a moment to say, say something about what philosophy is and what I do in particular. I know that many of you are familiar with this. I know you, that you've had philosophers on before to talk to you. Um, but since it doesn't tend to be a profession that most people are familiar with from day-to-day -day experience, I thought it might be worth just taking a minute or two. Of course, some of you will know about philosophy already uh, because perhaps you took a, a course once, perhaps it was the dreaded intro freshman year course. Philosophy is the study of the most basic principles and assumptions that underlie and inform just about everything we believe. So for example, uh, you may think that uh, a governor is uh, doing something good or bad. They're constructing good policy or bad policy. Um, but if you find yourself stopping for a moment to actually think carefully about what it would mean to act well or badly, right? What, what goodness and badness are exactly, right? what is moral goodness? Well, then you're doing philosophy, you're doing moral philosophy, right? When you pause to reflect, to consider the basic assumptions or presuppositions that are going into your everyday ethical or moral judgments. Or perhaps you think that uh, democracy is the best form of government that there is. Well, if you were to then step back from this claim and think about it more deeply, right? What is it exactly that we want from a system of government Right? How do the different possible systems of government compare in those ways? Well, then you'd be doing philosophy. In this case, you'd be doing political philosophy. Right? So as you've now correctly guessed, right, just based on a couple of examples, you can do philosophy in connection with almost anything, which is why I think people often mistake it in the public realm with just having an opinion. Right? That's not exactly what philosophy is. It does involve this, what I'm calling reflection on the basic assumptions and presuppositions that go into our um, otherwise everyday judgments. And because I'm a philosopher of science in particular, I spend most of my days thinking and writing and teaching about the basic assumptions that go into producing scientific knowledge and how we should understand that knowledge. Now, uh, why is all of that of interest to you? Well, as you know, of course, it's a long-standing part of the tradition of humanism to advocate the use of science and reason. Uh, we all aspire to goals like leading an ethical life and working toward the common good and our collective welfare. But to bring these things about, we need to act. And in order to act, we need information. Right? We need good information and we need to use that information wisely. Hence, science and reason. What I want to talk to you about today is the question of how the sciences can help us in just the ways uh, you think they should, right? Or at least I want to focus today on one very important aspect of that question. Today, I'm going to focus on the relationship between science and values. And by values here, I mean ethical values and social values. So here's the plan, right? In keeping with what I understand is your usual format, um, I'll aim to wrap up uh, speaking by 11 a.m. at the latest. In fact, I'm going to try to wrap up a little bit earlier than that because I think that hearing and discussing your comments and questions is an especially valuable thing to do, right? And then we'll have a discussion. Okay, good. So let's dig in. Now, Perhaps on reading my title, right, Ethical Values, Social Values, and the Sciences, uh, you're puzzled already, right? You might be thinking, what on earth do values have to do with science? After all, you might well think 
and this is a very popular idea, so you wouldn't be alone, right? that the reason we should rely on science as a source of guidance for how to act for the common good is precisely because it's neutral with respect to values. It's all about facts. Right? That's what we do when we investigate things scientifically. We try to illuminate and learn the facts and facts and values are very different sorts of things. Now, of course, there are certainly ways in which having certain values can lead to uh, what I might call interference with science. There are plenty of examples of this, many of which I'm sure would come to mind or that you could come up with if you thought about it for a moment. So for example, consider how uh, tobacco companies in the last century funded misleading studies to convince people that secondhand smoke isn't actually harmful. Or consider more recent attempts to undermine climate science through giving misrepresentative uh, mis or misleading presentations of it. So on the handout that I believe was sent to everyone earlier, um, if for whatever reason you don't have the handout, maybe you could just mention it in the chat and David or someone else could post a link to it there. Um, but on the, the handout, I've given you some references that go into more detail on some of the cases that I'll be talking about today in passing. And I've included there one for a great book by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, which discusses among other things, the tobacco industry and climate denialism. These are cases where certain kinds of values are interfering with science, right? Either by corrupting the work at the source by effectively paying for the results, right? Something that's often called the funder effect. Um, that's what was going on in the case of tobacco companies. Or by misrepresenting the work, and that's what's often going on in the case of climate science deniers. They aren't really cases where values are playing a role in genuine science as such, right? They're cases where values are playing a role to kind of subvert or undermine genuine science. So here it's usually straightforwardly understood by the people who are doing the corrupting and the misrepresenting of science that they're up to no good, right? That's the point. They're trying to twist things to serve an agenda other than the truth. You know, making money, consolidating power, whatever that agenda might be. In these sorts of care, uh, cases where it's transparent, even or especially to the people who are behaving badly, that their values are leading to them to pervert scientific knowledge in some way, these sorts of cases are obviously extremely important, but I'm going to set them aside for today. Today, I actually want to talk about something more subtle. It turns out that even in cases where we're doing our best, right, where we're not, or at least not consciously, at least, trying to mess things up by corrupting or misleading, even when we're all trying to do good right, and do good science, values are involved in producing scientific knowledge. And it isn't just that values sort of wander into scientific work by accident. I mean, that definitely happens. But it's also the case that it isn't even possible to separate out our values from science in various ways. Even if we do it as carefully as it can be done um, and we tell the truth about it. So even though it's very natural to think that matters of fact on the one hand and matters of value on the other hand are totally different sorts of things. It turns out that in practice, they're closely connected with one another. So in the rest of the time that I have today, I'm going to talk about three ways in which the sciences are not, as it turns out, even I think in, in certain cases, it isn't even possible for them to be value neutral, right? For them to be neutral with respect to values after all. And if that's so, then um, if we want to have science that's going to serve the purposes that humanists ultimately want it to serve or want them to serve, then we'd better make sure that our values are part of it, that the best values are part of this endeavor that we call the sciences. Okay, so let's turn to the first way in which ethical and social values play a role in science. Our values influence the directions of scientific research. Right? They determine what we choose to study and investigate. And as a result, they determine what kinds of knowledge we're able to get out of science. 
of course, once we stop to think about this for a moment, I think it's immediately obvious, right? There are only so many scientists, and like the rest of us, uh, they are finite creatures. There are only so many hours in the day. And furthermore, science is extraordinarily expensive, right? We don't have unlimited resources. So we can't study and investigate everything to the max, right? We have to make choices. So how are these choices made? How do we prioritize among the infinite number of things we could actually study and investigate? Our social and ethical values determine the directions of scientific research. As I just mentioned, they determine the questions that we end up focusing on and thus what answers science can actually be empowered to give us. As a result, they determine what tools we have when it comes to using this knowledge to actually act in the world. So here's an example. Right? When I was a, an undergraduate student, I became very interested in international development. And because a lot of my earlier studying was in the biomedical sciences, I was especially interested in what progress we'd made right, in research and development of medicines for diseases that disproportionately affect people in developing countries and the poor. Some of you will be familiar with this. Right? It turns out that we spend huge astronomical sums of money on potential drugs that can be potentially marketed to wealthy people in Western countries. But diseases of poverty? Well, you know, not so much. So malaria, tuberculosis, other tropical diseases? Well, you know, good luck to you. The latest drug to enhance, uh, say, male sexual vigor? Well, now you're talking, right? And by the way, I don't mean to suggest that the latter is unimportant. Uh, you might think that rationally applying our critical faculties to the realities of the sheer numbers of victims of diseases of poverty might be relevant to shaping priorities and directions of research in that area. But instead, we've designed a system of funding for and profiting from this research that just doesn't incentivize working on drugs that richer people don't need. Okay, so that's an example, a simple example, about how we choose to distribute resources and who may benefit from science and who may not benefit as a result. Here's another example, um, which is not unconnected to these issues. Um, is it obvious that scientists should be able to research just whatever they want, so long as they can find some way of covering the costs of it? Take the long-standing tradition of research into possible cognitive differences based on race and gender. To make a long story short, there's a kind of sad history here of how some people, including scientists, have made claims about, say, uh, the intellectual inferiority of women based on cognitive factors that have been repeatedly contested and revealed as bogus and corrected. And yet, that tradition survives, right? And some people on the margins of science continue to make these sorts of claims, which just helps to sustain these unsupported stereotypes. If you look at this work carefully, what you find is that even if it showed that there were small differences in averages right, by gender, which I don't think anyone serious really accepts, right? But even if those studies demonstrated that there were some small differences in these averages, the huge variation within genders is so much bigger that it swamps any interest in, you know, potentially small differences in averages. In other words, you know, within the male gender and within the female gender, there's so much variation with respect to these cognitive attributes that it really tells us nothing to know that there might be a tiny average difference. So when it comes to directions of research, let me quote my colleague, uh, Janet Kurani here. I've given you a, a reference to a nicely provocative paper that she wrote on this um, on your handout. Janet asks the provocative question. She says, how much freedom do scientists really need or deserve? After all, there are precedents here, right? We bar certain forms of biomedical and genomics research because of possible worries about what would happen if the things and technologies we might create fall into the wrong hands, like terrorists or people that otherwise have no moral compass. Studies show that 
merely hearing racist and sexist claims, even if they're bogus, negatively affects the stereotyped populations. It's harmful to people and it perpetuates cycles of harm. Does that suggest that we should think carefully about what directions of research we encourage and allow? Well, I just want to pose that question today, right? Um, I don't intend to answer it, although I'm happy to discuss it more during the discussion. It's a tough question, right? On the one hand, we have the value of freedom, freedom of research, which is of course a very important thing. The edifice of science requires a certain amount of freedom in order for it to operate in an optimal sort of way. On the other hand, some research programs may produce claims that are not only dubious, but have, that have negative implications for things like equality or human dignity. Now, it's not unusual in life to find that often when we're trying to decide what our best course of action is, our values conflict, right? That happens all the time. Well, you know, this value suggests I should do one thing, another value suggests I should do another thing. How do I weigh those things? How do I rank them? All I want to point out here is that when it comes to deciding what directions to take in science, our values are part of the equation. Like it or not, they determine ultimately what questions we ask. And as a result, what questions um, we can have answers to. And as a result, what we can actually do with that knowledge. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about why humanists are interested in the sciences, about the common idea that science should be value neutral, that is, you know, unaffected by ethical or social concerns, and about why this isn't really plausible in thinking about directions of scientific work. Let me move on now to thinking about some different ways in which science and values are entangled. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about scientific methods of investigation. One very obvious way in which values inevitably infiltrate our methods concerns ethical values, right? especially when it comes to studying things that are alive or studying things in ways that may affect living things or the environment. For example, uh, should we use animals in research, right? If, if so, um, under all conditions, right, always, or under what sorts of circumstances might it be okay? What about research that involves human subjects, right? Today, in most places, we have ethical review boards that have to approve research plans whenever they involve human beings, but that wasn't always the case. So there are amazing historical examples of work that from our current ethical perspective, we might be uncomfortable with right, or find troubling. Um, here's one example, it's a nice example, I think, which I'm sure many of you have come across at some point. Um, I have in mind the Milgram experiments that were conducted by a scientist, Stanley Milgram, uh, in the 1960s at Yale University. Uh, not surprisingly, after the Second World War and the horrors of Nazism and Nazi science, there was a lot of interest in better understanding how people respond to authority when it clashes with their personal conscience. <clears throat> so in the Milgram experiments, volunteers were solicited to help do the study, to help do the science. But what the volunteers didn't know was that Actually, um, they weren't just helping to run the experiment. In fact, they were the subjects of the experiment. So already here, you have a violation of what would be allowed today, right? The volunteers were actually lied to about what their role was in the experiment that they were participating in. So here's the basic idea for those of you who hadn't come across it before. The volunteers were told that they were helping to run an experiment on how people learn, how they learn things. Actually, right, in actual fact, it was an experiment to study what lengths people will go to in doing unethical things if they're told to do those things by an authority figure. So the volunteer was shown a learner who, uh, interestingly, was restrained and hooked up to what looked like electrodes. And then the volunteer was taken into a different room where he could still communicate with the learner, right, through a microphone kind of set up and speakers. And from the separate room, he would give the learner a test. And the test was a memory test. So the volunteer would read pairs of words to the learner and then ask that person to repeat them. If the learner got something wrong, then the volunteer was told by an authority figure, right, perhaps 
uh, you know, someone in a lab coat with a clipboard and horn rimmed glasses, right, looking seriously scientific. He was told to push a button that would give the learner an electric shock. And for every wrong answer, the voltage would go up. Now, as it happens, um, there was no learner and there were no shocks, right? The learner was an actor and the shocks were pretend, right? But the volunteers didn't know this. So the whole setup was just to see how far someone would go in what they believed was causing pain to someone else when this you know, causing pain to someone else was sanctioned by someone that was in a position of authority. They even had uh, taped sounds that they would use so that when a shock was given, the learner could be heard to be like banging on the wall or crying out in pain right, or begging for mercy. And then at some point, they would just stop making sounds, which the ominous implications that something had gone terribly wrong. Right? So in the very first experiments that Milgram did, 65% of people were willing to go all the way up to the maximum voltage of 450 volts. Everyone was willing to go up to at least 300 volts. Now, as you can imagine, a lot of these volunteers were tortured by their role in this experiment. They showed all kinds of signs of nervousness, um, ultimately emotional stress. In many of these cases, uh, the stress was very severe. This is now a classic example of a research methodology that one might argue uh, was probably um, ethically compromised. Now, this sort of example may look incredible to many of us now, I think, because the idea that some dubious values were in play may seem obvious or at least arguable to most people. But there are also cases um, where values are built into the science that may be far from obvious, but still highly consequential. So let me give you another example. This one comes from my colleague, uh, Heather Douglas. Again, the reference to her very nice paper on this is on your handout. She describes a case in which values are, she argues, a required part of scientific reasoning itself. They aren't something that you could strip out, even if you wanted to. Sometimes values are required even to know how to read and interpret the data of scientific work. So here's the example. As you know, we have a, a scary history of toxic by, uh, byproducts of manufacturing and other factory processes being released into the environment. Um, and once they get into the environment, they often do immense harm. Dioxins are one example of this. These dioxins, they're produced in various ways. Uh, they're, they're a byproduct of making um, herbicides, uh, of bleaching paper, and so on, various factory processes. At a certain point, in the manufacturing of these other things that were giving off these dioxins, worries started to arise about the possible effects on human health of the release of this chemical waste product into lands where they were contaminating the water and then building up in sources of food like dairy and meat and fish. And we know now that dioxins cause all kinds of very serious problems in humans, including cancers. But to know those things, we had to investigate. So what they did was they exposed rats to various levels of dioxin, and then they performed autopsies to see what effects this had. In the first long-term study on this, it was published in uh, 1978, they focused on liver cancer. And to make a long story short, right, here was the challenge that they faced in doing this scientific research. When examining the slides that were prepared from the liver biopsies of the rats that had been exposed to different levels of dioxins, well, it was clear from some of those slides that they were cancerous, right? There were cancerous tumors. In some of the slides, it was clear that they were not, there was nothing cancerous there, right? No tumors. But then there were a bunch of slides that were, you know, somewhere in between. It wasn't entirely clear how they should be classified. Something looked like it could well be a cancerous tumor, but it's not entirely clear. Here's something that looks a bit less like a cancerous tumor, but it might still be. There was a whole bunch of gray area in between. And in fact, it could be a very tough call to make. And even experts, people who are experts in you know, the relevant science, um, disagreed. 
and could disagree about how best to classify these slides. So the question was, how do you classify this data? You need to classify the data one way or another in order to be able to generate statistics about you know, whether these things are harmful or not and in what concentrations. Well, if you're very strict one way right, and classify anything that's unclear as cancerous, well, then you run the risk of having false positives. That is counting something as cancerous when actually it isn't. On the other hand, if you're very strict the other way and classify anything that's you know, a bit dubious or unclear as not cancerous, well, then you run the opposite risk right, of false negatives. That is not counting genuinely cancerous slides. So how do we strike the balance right, in, in these cases? I mean, on reflection, in deciding how to do this, values inevitably play a role, right? I mean, what are we most concerned about? Do we err on the side of caution, right? If we do, and we say we're more likely to, on that basis, protect human health, well, you know, that may come at the cost of the profitability of manufacturers and the employment they provide, because they'll have to pay more to reduce environmental pollution. On the other hand, if we err on the side of being less cautious, um, because you know the employment that they provide is actually extremely important and foundational to the economic well-being of a given region, well, if we do that, then it's more likely that manufacturers will be profitable and perhaps uh, able to hire greater numbers of people and support that kind of economic development that helps a community, but maybe at the cost of human life. So sometimes, values are central to how we actually do science, how we do things like read and interpret the scientific evidence. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about how ethical and social values uh, can play fairly central roles in scientific practice, from thinking about what directions our science should take to thinking about the methods that we use to investigate the things we've chosen to investigate. Let me give you uh, one last sort of class of examples and conclude with one last way in which values are important to science, which really has to do with how our values can shape the kinds of assumptions that we bring to scientific work. These assumptions, which in turn end up shaping what we come to believe. So as we've just seen, often interpreting the data of scientific inquiry isn't exactly simple, right? Often it's extremely complicated and there are lots of complexities that need to be sorted out. Sorting these things out and figuring out what to believe based on our evidence is inevitably informed by all sorts of background assumptions that we have or presuppositions that we bring to the table. So in the time I have left, let me just give you one last example, which I think uh, illustrates this idea of how our values can play a central role even in our best science. And this example I'm borrowing from my colleague, Helen Longineau. And again, if you're interested to read more, uh, I've given you the reference to the relevant chapter of her book on the handout. So this case focuses on some work in the field of early hominid evolution. In other words, the study of how hominids, right? hominids are the group of primates that fall into the same family as humans. Right, like our, our more recent ancestors um, and a few other contemporary groups like uh, bonobos, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, right? They're all hominids. So this work really focuses on um, how this group, this evolutionarily important group evolved to become the sorts of creatures that they are today. And more specifically, this is a, a case study really in the field of paleoanthropology. So paleoanthropology is the study of fossilized human beings. Uh, the earliest of these creatures lived on African savannas about 3.5 million years ago. Uh, they were about the size of modern day chimpanzees. They had slightly larger brains uh, and they walked upright. So the question is, I guess the initial question is how do we know these things? Well, we know them through a study of the fossil record and that's what paleoanthropologists are up to. So for example, from facts about their anatomy, which you can um, discern from the, their skeletal remains that have been fossilized, you can determine certain things about what they were like. 
if their pelvises were tilted this way or that way or fit in in a certain way with respect to their leg bones, you might be able to tell whether they're um, upright walking on two legs or not. Right? So there are various things you can tell just from examining the fossil record. A large part of paleoanthropology is concerned with describing the life and the behavior of these early um, hominids. And in particular, three key developments in the evolution of our species really cry out um, for, for explanation. So I've listed these on your handout. The first one is the shift from walking on all fours to walking on two legs, that is becoming bipedal. The second one is the development over time of an increased cranial capacity. So that is having larger brains of the sort that we have now. And the third thing that really cried out for explanation was um, the making and the use of stone tools that were also found in the fossil record, which is a marker of you know, significant cognitive development. So the, the question then became, how do we explain these changes, right? The changes that led to becoming bipedal, having larger brains, and making and using tools. What evolutionary pressures led to these changes in this population of organisms? So one idea, it was the focus of a research program in the 1960s, was that hunting was the driving force behind human evolution. So the idea was that um, if males hunted and females raised young and were primarily responsible for looking after um, you know, the offspring, the children, this would lead to the, the establishment of home bases. You need an area where it's safe for females to take care of the young, that's sheltered, etc. cetera. Um, the females and young would have a place to wait safely as hunts became longer and more complex and males were away for longer periods of time. So no, there's a kind of sex-based division of labor that was theory, theorized here that would permeate all aspects of life, right? It would permeate, for example, education, right? The training of male children would take a different form than the training of female children, right? Males would learn how to scan the environment. They would learn tracking and stalking and pursuit and all of these things that were relevant to hunting. So how would this picture explain the three things that I said were crying out for explanation, right? And figuring out how these early hominid populations evolved. Well, take bipedalism first. If you think that hunting is really crucial in explaining how we came to be what we're like today, well, selective pressure to free the hands for tool use in hunting might be a very important factor. And that might then exert some selective pressure to walk on two limbs. If you're hunting and you need to throw a spear or an ax or whatever it is right, to grapple with your prey, then being able to walk on two legs would certainly be an advantage. What about larger brains? Well, as the demands of hunts became more and more sophisticated, right, the demands um, began to exert selective pressures for things like better communication between hunters, right, for logistics. How do you stalk certain kinds of prey? Larger and larger prey are actually more dangerous, so you need a strategy for how you're going to tackle them and so on. So the requirements of planning, logistics, and communication would, again, exert a selective pressure for greater intelligence and thus larger brains, mental development, greater intelligence, larger cranial capacity. What about tools? Well, um, you can think of the use of tools in terms of hunting and butchering animals. Um, for those of you who are, you know, like me, passed through a phase or maybe still in a phase where you're addicted to National Ge Geographic type programs where they talk about these things, you know, one of the tools that they found a lot in the historical record are what they call bifaces, right? They're sort of symmetrical um, stones. They're chipped on both sides to come to a point. And it was theorized that the symmetry of these bifaces, these stone tools were very important because if you're attaching them to the end of a stick to throw as a spear or something like that, um, you would want these, these things to be as symmetrical as possible so that their flight would be true, right? You could gauge their trajectory. Um, here's another thing that, that was theorized. Over time, the size of our canine teeth, right, these, the pointy ones here, right, um, decreased. And certainly they decreased in males. And so one explanation for this was the thought that, well, 
as they began to use tools more effectively, then being able to show threatening behaviors towards you know, possible predators using your canine teeth, right, the way lots of animals do, was no longer necessary because we could communicate threats with you know, weapons. And so there would be a loss of selective pressure on canines and over time their size would decrease. Okay, so that was the story. The theory was called Man the Hunter. Now, about a decade later, a number of other paleoanthropologists started saying, wait a minute, right? there's something odd about all of this. And in order to help expose what they suspected to be a hidden bias in the production of the theory, Man the Hunter, some paleoanthropologists developed an alternative theory. Right? They called the alternative theory, Woman the Gatherer. So the goal was really to show how hidden values have shaped scientific theorizing in such a way as to produce the theory Man the Hunter. So Woman the Gatherer begins by accepting the division of labor that was posited by Man the Hunter. Males hunt, females gather. But rather than focusing on the role of males in bringing about all of the significant challenges, sorry, changes that resulted in the evolution of modern hominids, Woman the Gatherer focused its attention on the role played by females. In other words, it targeted the central thesis of Man the Hunter, the idea that hunting was the driving force behind hominid evolution. So Woman the Gatherer suggested that hunting actually became significant much later in human development. In fact, hunting wouldn't have even been possible if it were not for the sort of um, technological and social base that was provided by gathering already that would allow these groups of organisms to have stable home bases. Um, so consider a few things, right? You don't actually need to hunt in order to obtain sufficient protein for nutrition. You know, insect, insects, for example. This is something I saw in another one of those National Geographic programs. Apparently, termites make a delicious stir fry. I don't, I don't remember the recipe, otherwise I might be tempted to try it. We have lots of termites here in, in Florida. Anyway, insects, invertebrates, small animals, all of these things are easily caught and very nutritious. And this theorizing was supported by studies of contemporary hunter-gatherer societies. There are still some, there are you know, increasingly under pressure, um, and they may not exist for very much longer, but there are still some contemporary hunter-gatherer societies. And this kind of theorizing was supported by observations of how they actually right, provide for their own nutrition. So consider the three things, again, that I said are markers of evolution to this modern hominid state. Well, consider bipedalism. Gathering and carrying food might exert a very strong selective pressure for bipedal movement. If you need to have your arms free so that you can pick things and carry them and bring them back to the home base, then it would be helpful to be able to walk on two legs. What about larger brains? Well, there may be a selective pressure for greater mental development, but not necessarily for hunting, but rather for sophisticated methods of gathering, right? Things like cooperation, division of labor, right? If we all go out in our separate ways and all come back with turnips, that might not make the best, you know, nutritious uh, dinner for our, our clan of organisms. So this might require greater social organization, cooperation, division of labor, all of the sorts of linguistic communications and, ling and logistic demands that were associated with hunting might be associated with gathering. What about tools? Well, again, a lot of contemporary societies um, use these tools primarily for doing things like cracking open nuts and fruit, for cutting, for pounding roots, and so on. And if you think about it, mothers with dependent off offspring would have faced the most severe adaptive pressures, right? Because they have to take care of young while at the same time doing other things. So females would have faced the greatest need to innovate right, with things like tools to minimize time and energy expended. So things like the construction of slings for carrying infants so that you don't need to hold them in your hands, right? So freeing your hands for gathering. Or take for that matter, um, the other point that I mentioned, the reduction of male canine sizes. Well, males with smaller canines are less prone to aggression. So as a result, 
if they're less prone to aggression, there are less danger to one's offspring. And so it's plausible that they, males with smaller canines might fare better in sexual selection by females. Okay, that was a long example, but I think it's an interesting one. The moral of it is simply this. Note that Woman the Gatherer, this alternative theory, did exactly the same thing that Man the Hunter did. That is, it identified a role played by a particular group as the driving force behind the recent evolution of hominids. When Woman the Gatherer was uh, first proposed and developed in the 1970s, my understanding is that it was something of a shock to the scientific community. And what happened was that some people attempted to argue for their favorite model, either Man the Hunter or Woman the Gatherer, by citing relevant evidence. But many of them thought, on reflection, that you know, both of these models, both of these theories, actually account for the data quite well. And that perhaps it wasn't just males or just females that were the driving force behind the events that led to the evolution of us. So the conclusion that Longino draws from all of this is the following, right? She says, the way in which the data, the evidence that we have, are joined to our hypotheses and theories, this connection of the data and evidence to our hypotheses and theories, she says, and here I quote, it floats on a sea of assumptions. Our assumptions are often laden with our interests and yes, our values. Perhaps at one time it just seemed obvious, right, to those whose opinions mattered, that only the contributions of males could be important to human history. But that assumption exemplifies a value, right, a kind of androcentric bias that needed to be exposed in order for our science to become better. And I think this serves as a, a nice reminder, and also the last of my examples for today, of why it's important to reflect on our values because they have an enormous impact, not only in all of the places you'd expect them to, but also in places where you might not have imagined they'd be so important, like in the operation of our best science. So I think I'll leave it there. Thanks again for inviting me and uh, joining in this morning and I look forward to your comments and questions. So our first question is the guy right beside me um, go ahead, I'll ask your question. Okay, uh, Doc. Uh, there's some that, that hit the news just yesterday about the, uh, that's right down the fairway of what you're talking about. Uh, first, the first prospective clinical trial of vitamin D for treatment of COVID showed a 60 to 70 percent reduction in deaths and in ICE and intensive care admission uh, treatments amongst people treated with vitamin D. It's been obvious for over a year that vitamin D has a lot to do with, can, can be a very valuable tool in treating COVID, but the study never got done until, never got done until now. There are two probable reasons that people were reluctant to do this study. One is that there's no money in vitamin D because it's dirt cheap and easy to mass produce. The other is that the main evidence in favor of it was the much higher impact of COVID-19 on people with dark skins. And recognizing that very fact that, oh, dark skins are associated with vitamin D deficiency, there, there's a 300% mortality ratio with, with um, people with dark skins under, with COVID-19. If you say that, you're blaming the victims. You're saying that there are racial differences that make a big difference in in, in outcomes. So we have two different reasons to not do the study. What's your question? So isn't it true that we have so many reasons to not do studies that science was reduced to a random walk, just the studies that just happened to get done? Um, it's a nice example, um, I, I think for at least two reasons, which are kind of represented by the, the two reasons you gave for why studies may not have been conducted earlier. I mean, the, the first is extremely important because it taps into um, something I mentioned earlier, which is the profit motive for certain kinds of choices about we, what we do research in. And you know, the example I gave and the example that you gave are, of course, the tip of the iceberg. Um, we all know that uh, preventative medicine and preventative health 
right? So going beyond medicine, there are a lot of preventative health measures that you might take that are not pharmaceutical and not medical um, in the sense of, you know, finding drugs that will address certain um, conditions after the fact. They are enormously, enormously impactful, right? And of course, it's much, much better to prevent something than it is to try to treat it later on down the road when you may be more or less successful and often less, unfortunately. But there's no money to be made in preventative medicine. Right? I mean, no one is going to make a big profit by suggesting that if you ate a bit more of this or you did a bit more of that, um, you wouldn't have the difficulty that we can later on treat with a drug. So, I mean, that is really the tip of the iceberg of the kind of thing I had in mind when we say our values here you know, they're often implicit. We may not have even thought about it before, but when you look at how our research is funded, right, you see that, well, the only thing that's going to drive it is profits by these large corporations. Of course, they're not going to be interested in preventative measures or things that, you know, like vitamin D, if it's inexpensive, won't garner them significant profits. So I think this is very much, I just want to say, yes, I think this is an excellent example of this sort of thing, but I hope we can avoid drawing the, the negative conclusion that you know it's a random walk i think it seems like a random walk because often we haven't really reflected on it and we just thought oh it just went this way and it went that way in this case i think there were real reasons and real values in play that have driven the structure of how we fund research that need to be examined and so it's incumbent on people like you and me and others to actually subject these things to the light of day and scrutiny so we can see what values are, are operating here and if we don't like them, then we you know, need to do something about it. Um, the second way in which I think you accounted for why this research maybe hadn't taken off earlier is again, extremely important. The idea that you know, a certain hypothesis might have been viewed as a racialized hypothesis. And so it would have been difficult to explore. And that's where, again, I think um, properly, genuinely, you know, serious scientific work is crucial because when you do, properly uh, randomized and controlled studies, you can avoid worries about saying, well, we're, you know, the study is racialized because you would include people of all different skin pigmentations, you would include people of different ages, you would include people with prior medical conditions, not. And, you know, that is part of, it's one of the methodologies of the sciences to control for various kinds of uh, parameters. And if you do that well, then, that's a way of avoiding the idea that, well, we're just going to target these people for a study or we're going to think that, you know, there's a prior hypothesis that's suggested because of the color of someone's skin. But that requires for there to be good, controlled, randomized work done. And it's often a problem in the medical sciences, right? Um, getting funding for good studies with large enough populations that would meet that criterion. Um, Gretchen Quinn has a comment or question. In research, why not create an uncertain category, which would be expressed in reporting the results as somewhere between uh, a percent and a second, two percents, you know, two different percents? Right, right, good. So I'm, I'm guessing that this is um, especially relevant to the example I gave about the studies of dioxin and the cancer slides, where, you know, there were some slides that clearly suggested one outcome. There are other slides that clearly suggested another outcome. And then there was a degree of in between not knowing which way to go. So you're absolutely right. That is one decision you could make. You could say, look, anything below a certain threshold, we're going to say is not cancerous. Anything above a certain threshold, we're going to say is cancerous. And then anything between those two thresholds, we're just going to suspend judgment about, right? We're just going to be neutral with respect to. You could do that. That's one kind of choice you could make. What's interesting about that, though, is that that choice also has consequences for what you take the result of the study to be, right? So if you don't include any of that data, you say that data is too uncertain, right? So we're not going to make a pronouncement on it. That is also going to skew the conclusion that you draw in a particular direction. So there really is no choice, right, of how to characterize the data that isn't going to push the conclusion that you draw, right, in some direction, right? So if you're very liberal and you count anything that looks like it might even look like it has the hint of cancer to it, that's going to push it in one direction. If you include almost nothing, unless it's very obviously cancerous, it's going to push it in another direction. If you exclude all of the data in the middle, right, a lot of people might say, look, 
that data is valuable data by excluding it or labeling it uncertain. We're not availing ourselves of the best information we have to be able to draw the conclusion and your data becomes much smaller. And when you're drawing data on a smaller set, right, of uh, information or observations, then your conclusions are going to be less strong. So then is it strong enough for you to make policy on, right? I could imagine companies saying, well, this data is like, there are only a few slides that we counted in coming to a conclusion. So, you know, surely you can't require us to stop pumping this stuff into the environment on the basis of this whimsy data. Um, so this isn't to suggest that your, um, the possibility you indicate of how we might categorize the data, right, is not a good one. We could do that. But however we decide to do it, there are going to be implications. And so what I wanted to suggest is that our values will drive in part what choices we make. Because if we think that ultimately, look, the most important thing is that we protect human health. And it doesn't matter if the companies are going to have to pay more right, to deal with. Then you really are going to not want to count all of that data as uncertain. You're going to want to take the ones that look like they're plausibly cancerous as genuinely cancerous. Thank you. Uh, Dave DiNucci has a question. He's Some of the examples you gave actually scare me a fair amount because they make it, they seem to justify all of the criticisms I hear from anti-science people. Um, and for example, the studies of intelligence, let's say, uh, the suggestion that we shouldn't even look into certain, collecting certain data because we might not like the way it's interpreted on the back end. Um, and in the middle example, which you just uh, re-described, uh, this example that the scientists should, uh, should change the way that they record the data based on their concerns about the way the data will be interpreted. Um, in both of those cases, um, I mean, the anti-science people will come out and say, yes, that's what's happening. And I will, I usually say, no, that's not what's happening. Uh, you know, the science is all about recording the data accurately, may, putting it out there, and then, you know, we can interpret it as we will. But, um, but to have the scientists come in at the front end and change either the data that's collected or the way that it's recorded before it even goes off to analysis uh, seems to me very uh, contradictory. In fact, for example, your intelligence example, um, it seems to me that there's more problem created by not even collecting that information and having both sides claiming that the information shows the other thing uh, than it is to actually collect the accurate information and attempt to interpret it in a, in a correct uh, manner and have have some competition in the interpretation, that's fine, but, um, but at least to have the data out there to interpret accurate data. Right, okay, great. Um, so you raised several things there that I think are, are absolutely crucial and that are really impossible to avoid grappling with, right? So let me sketch a, a picture of the sciences that it turns out is not really a viable picture of the sciences, but one that we often rely on in combating science skeptics or people who want to you know, undermine the sciences. Right? We represent the sciences as being, you know, if not infallible, right? Something close to infallible. Um, they're perfectly objective. They're getting at the truth. They're so on and so forth, right? Of course, I believe that a lot of those things are true um, I believe that they're the outputs of good scientific work. Right? The problem is that if we take that as a caricature too seriously, it really makes our best science easy pickings for our science denialists. Because the truth of the matter is, right, and this is a hard truth, but I think we have to accept it, is that science develops over time. Science increases the levels of accuracy with which it describes the world. We change our minds about what our best accounts of the world are. Theorizing in all fields, in physics, in biology, in chemistry, in the social sciences, it evolves over time. And ideally, and I certainly believe this, it gets better and better, 
by collecting more and more data and subjecting it to better and better analysis and ultimately arriving at things that are, if not completely true, quite close to the truth, et cetera. But if we present all of science as though it's just true, it's too easy, I think, for science skeptics to point at all of the things that we believed last week but no longer believe and say, that's science, right? It's just changing its mind all the time. So instead of you know, representing the sciences as being infallible, what I think is important for us to do is to have a public that's better educated better educated in the nature of science, that at any given time, our best science is our best bet for knowledge, right? I mean, you saw this unfold during the, the early stages of uh, the COVID-19 crisis, where we had very little data, scientists were doing the best with the data they had, they would say things, and then a week later, or two weeks later, they'd say, you know what, we have more data now, um, we have a, a better take on what's going on now, it's this. And some people would draw the wrong conclusion for that. They'd say, oh, the scientists don't know anything. Look, they said this last week, and now they're saying this this week, and they're going to say something else next week, right? But all that does is betray a real lack of understanding of what the scientific process is like, right? It's always our best bet at any given moment. That doesn't prevent it from improving over time. So I think I, I feel your, your pain, right? We want to represent the sciences as the exemplary best possible way of knowing about the world. I think that's true, but it also has to be compatible with the idea that it improves over time, that it's corrigible, that sometimes we discover that there were biases that were in the work that we weren't aware of, but now we've exposed them and so we're getting better. It has to be compatible with all of those things. Um, and let me just tie this into some of the things you mentioned towards the end of your uh, question. So, you know, with respect to the intelligence uh, investigations, investigations of cognitive differences. One of the things that's interesting about Janet Karani's paper is that she claims, look, it's not that, that knowing objective facts about the world is a bad thing, but in this particular case, and she takes you back through the history of some of it, right? It's just all been bad. And it's clear now that this science is a dead end and it's bad. And yet people are still doing it, right? So under those circumstances, and she's trying to be provocative, right? Should we have a conversation about whether people should still do this? Because experts have again and again and again debunked this work. Now, there are other people who say, look, there are real dangers to prohibiting anything. Right? And I think for good reasons that you know, you're kind of hinting at, if you prohibit something, it makes people want to do it, right? So you know, how might we build into the infrastructure of our science and how we fund it, that you know, people with authority are allowed to make good judgment about what's promising and good to do and what you know, is not promising and what might be harmful to do that doesn't amount to outright prohibition on certain kinds of work. Because that, I think, may well not help the situation at all because you know, we're often contrary. So I know that what I've said is really just scratched the surface of some of your questions, but. Yeah, well Thank you. I, I did want to say I, you know, I certainly didn't want to question the idea that science evolves and that we always have wrong answers and we're always refining those. Uh, that that I absolutely completely agree with. Thank you. Uh, Robert Sanford says, if you think bipedalism is a pure advantage, try catching a cat. And uh, Dave Petworth replies, I once met a man who worked his way through grad school in early 1920s by catching cats for lab use. He said they will run, but they won't run far, and they tired easily. He would just throw rocks at them until they tired out. That was using the brain. <laughs> uh, uh, we've got a little bit more formal question, though, by Renga. Renga, can you come on and ask a question, okay. please? Yeah. Uh, you talked about these uh, uh, value based bringing value investigating science and what impact it has got on the way the science is done or what is done and its effect on okay other uh, humans and other everyday life but this need not necessarily be only with uh, impact on human life it seems to be there even for as a, as a, a pure science the prime example of that is the argument between Einstein and Niels Bohr. Uh, 
on this uh, role of quantum mechanics within the whether whether the random uncertainty or it is something determinism einstein believed being that something must be a definite god cannot be playing dice and things like that but the majority of scientists went ahead with the other notion and now the present day quantum mechanics which has developed and which is the basics of a lot of science is really came out of that that means that's the belief value system which they brought in which is what did that one so it's developed to uh, it uh, led to the development of the science in a diff one, one different way similar thing has happened in recent times with high energy physics you know in the early days of high energy physics there were things like what is called rajay poles and things like that we which used to explain the high energy phenomena quite well and uh, he, he, uh, and he, it had a long run but then soon over the concept of symmetry coming into the particle physics took place and that developed more and more and more people somehow put their efforts into that and that so the higher energy physics particle physics now basically is based on symmetry not that rajay pol theory or anything was wrong or anything like that but it did not get developed so this bringing in value by a single person or a group of people as a great effect how the science progresses and what we achieve not that there is the only science which is the right one or the correct one the other one is wrong but something gets emphasized something gets neglected so there the pure belief values bring in thus affect pure science very well even though it may not have a direct impact on everyday life or human life what do you think of what do you have comments on that sure great so first of all i i can't resist saying something about the the prior comment about bipedalism um 6 weeks ago my wife and i adopted uh, a greyhound yeah um, greyhound racing florida was one of the last uh states in the country to allow greyhound racing but the last tracks closed on december 31st and uh, we brought home a greyhound he has an injury um so he's tripedal right now one of his uh, legs is in a cast yeah. and on three legs he can go so much faster than i can even at full speed on two legs that um, you know i greatly appreciate the import of of that prior question yes. but turning to you know other sorts of values and certainly in the development of uh, 20th century physics um i think that there are all kinds of values at work in the sciences in both theorizing and in what we would call theory choice you know you have a phenomenon you're trying to understand it you have rival theories both of which might explain what's going on but they're inconsistent or incompatible with one another we have to make a decision as the community of scientists about which one has more promise right so this is part of what was going on in the early days of the 20th century when uh the quantum mechanics was being formulated and it was a probabilistic theory and einstein was unsatisfied with the fact that its mathematical formulation was probabilistic and people like niels bohr were saying no that's okay this is what it tells us about reality in those sorts of cases i think there are all kinds of values that come into play so when you know einstein says you know god does not play dice with the universe so this can't be the final story right of what matter is and and energy is like in the world what very small constituents of matter are like um you might think that that's a theological value. i'm not sure we should take that very seriously in the case of einstein at least you know i think he just really didn't like the idea that um the theory was stochastic or you know uh that it was probabilistic and his quip about god was just a nice way of putting that um it certainly was the case that i think that people like niels bohr and and um and werner heisenberg it wasn't like a non theological motivation that caused them to pursue a different interpretation of quantum mechanics that said there are lots of other values that enter into the process so you know deciding which way to go often turns on um things like aesthetic judgments right i mean what sort of theory would better mesh with our background knowledge and how right so i'm using aesthetic in kind of a broad way here 
that would incorporate other features of theories, like, you know, how simple are they? How well do they cohere with other things we know? What kind of promise do we think they have for future development? And so on and so forth. And it's possible to have values regarding all of those things, right? And those also factor into scientific work. So I'd certainly agree with the thrust of your question that there's a lot more going on um, and that the ethical and social values that I was talking about today are really just a, a piece of that puzzle. Uh, we've got a, a, another fun question. That I'm, I'm glad you clarified what, about the dog because I did see his little cast. Did he break his leg or what happened? We don't know how it happened, but he has a dislocated, I want to call it an ankle. I'm sure it's not called that on a dog. It might be the hawk. Yeah. Um, but uh, he, it was dislocated. We picked him up that way when he came from the racing track. So we knew that he had this injury. Don't know how it happened exactly, um, but he's been in his uh, splint now for uh, six and a half weeks and it'll be another week and a half before he's out. So good, 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 good. He's not doing well though, he's on the mend. Good, beautiful dogs. Uh, I do have a question from Sheila Pastore, kind of a fun one. And I think it's because you're, you're such a fine speaker too, but uh, she um, was curious, and several of us are, uh, are you any connection, a family connection to the host of the podcast, Hidden Brain? You share the same last name. Right, right. So is, now is the, who is the, I was thinking of Shankar Vedanta. Is oh, he maybe a, that's it. He's the host of Hidden Brain, but he might be the host of a different show on NPR. Yeah. I'm not sure. There's uh, a Chakra Bharti, Rita Chakra Bharti on NPR. Uh -huh. And she hosts a similar program, or maybe it's Hidden Brain that she hosts. I'm not sure. But the long and the short, uh, the short of it is, um, I don't know of any particular relation to any famous Chakravartis out there. Out there. Um, on, in the subcontinent, uh, it's not an uncommon name in the northeastern part of India and Bangladesh. That's where the Chakravartis, I think, arose and uh, proliferated originally. You see it spelled in a lot of different ways because as I think I mentioned to some people over email earlier, yeah. it's not clear how it's best translated into English characters. So, you know, chakra party yeah. with an I at the end or why yeah. B's instead of V's, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I don't know of any direct relation to famous chakra parties, but I would, uh, I would love for that to, to be the case. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Adele has a comment, research by universities where profit is not the driving force is very important and is a, a rational a rationale for continuing university research. Uh, your comment on that? Well, I, I certainly agree um, with that. Um, having sources of funding that are not obviously and directly, you know, in some cases it's very transparently connected to special interests in the outcomes of that research is extraordinarily important. It's greatly under pressure at even public universities these days because public universities these days are often public only in name. I mean, a lot of the great public universities that you know, if you look at their actual uh, uh, balance sheets are only funded to a very small extent by the state and a great deal of their funding comes from private sources. Um, and that's just adapting to the financial realities of the day in order to compete with private universities and so on. So you know, even in cases where it looks as though uh, research may be funded by disinterested sources that may or may not be the case. And there have been cases exposed, for example, in recent years where you know, the Koch brothers, for example, uh, gave a lot of money to uh, some universities to get them to hire people in social policy or economics. Um, and they had strings attached, you know, that certain kinds of people couldn't be hired and that they would have to have a say in who was hired and so on and so forth. So I think um, I completely agree with the, the motivation for the, the comment and the sentiment of the comment. Um, I think it's become increasingly difficult to do and we have to be vigilant to make sure that to the extent that it can be done, it is being done. Dave Gray uh, has a comment. In science, there is almost always uncertainty. We must accept that and strive to reduce the uncertainty by using new evidence. And I think he's just very much in agreement with what, what you've said. Uh, Joyce, Joyce Lackey, I once took a seminar in which the professor supported the possible argument that females 
multitask better than males because they have to. Survival and nurturing of their children, other child care, providing food and gathering, keeping a clean environment. Is that just another gender bias? Without being well versed in what scientific investigation and studies there are in this area, I'm tempted to guess yes. I'm tempted to guess that it is just another gender bias. I'm sure that there is research on this, and then there's you know a question as to how good that research is. Um, when I report that there are problems with the cognitive differences research, um, I'm not sure whether research into that particular parameter, namely multitasking, uh, was among the things that have been repeatedly debunked. But let me just say that I wouldn't be surprised at all, in part because of something I mentioned during the talk, which is that what this research tends to show is that variations within genders right, are so much bigger than any results of the studies that show that there might be a tiny difference in the average between male and female, that it's almost a meaningless thing to say that, oh, there's a difference. Because if you look at a population of females, there's going to be a huge variation. And similarly, within the population of males. Um, I will add, though, however, um, that you know, I, if it's true, I may be a counterexample because I'm sure that I'm much better at multitasking uh, than my wife. No. Uh, Sharon had a uh, Sharon Joy had a continue uh, a bit more information that I missed. Uh, the reason why a cure is quite remote is the profit. In it is a and it's a and it uh, the profit lays in research and new drugs that a cure can wipe out in one stroke. Do we value money, in other words, keeping a, a chronic disease chronic rather than finding a cure? Do we the, the, the money that can be raised by a chronic illness compared to a cure? Do we value money too much? You know, now I, I will out myself further. I'm a Canadian originally, although just a, a few weeks ago, uh, my, my wife, my partner and I both became American citizens. So now we're, we're dual citizens. Um, the, the comment that I'm going to make doesn't really distinguish that well between Canadian and American society, but the healthcare system in Canada generally is quite different from the healthcare system in the US. And the extent to which money runs the show in the United States is, you know, just, I never cease to be shocked and horrified by the extent to which that's the case. And so, you know, I would have to say yes. I mean, I think that there are certain kinds of things that we have to value because of their importance to the integrity of human life and human dignity and beyond human life and human dignity. Um, and making a, a profit motive the driver and primary desideratum of how those things are handled seems to be asking for trouble. It just seems to be asking for trouble. Now, when I say things like this, you know, some of my friends here say, are you one of those Canadian socialists? I have to say, I'm, I'm not, uh, so far as I know, uh, a socialist. I just think that when it comes to certain kinds of decisions, we might want to base them on factors other than how much money can it make a certain number of people who may have no ultimate interest in your health, right? Or at least rank that as uh, something that's much less important than the profit of their company. So I would have to say, yes. I mean, how could it not be? when you see the kind of travesty that is unfolding in terms of healthcare and a, a lot of research um, in this country, and not just in this country, in many Western countries. Uh, of course, there's a lot of great work being done, and a lot of it is just funded by, you know, um, some of it's funded by public sources, some of it's funded by very wealthy people who have a personal interest in funding research in that area. Thank you, it was wonderful.